Welcome to this special edition of Scottsdale Roundup, where we'll take a peek into the past of the west most western town, Scottsdale. Hear the story of the soul of Scottsdale, discover the roots of the Prada del Sol Parade, learn about one of Scottsdale's oldest buildings, uncover the international mystery at McCormick Stillman Railroad Park, and get a glimpse of what lurked beneath the water in El Dorado Lake. Stay tuned! We're firing up the Wayback Machine for a trip through Scottsdale's history. Here we go! Located in the heart of Old Town Scottsdale, the old Adobe Mission has stood as a beacon of culture and history. Local historian Leonard Marcis introduces us to the soul of Scottsdale. The heart of Scottsdale can be found in its lively downtown district with world-class shopping, dining, and entertainment. But what of its soul? Perhaps that distinction belongs to this structure. Its construction represents a story of Scottsdale's soul, a story of religious and cultural commitment that transformed its builders. This is the old Adobe Mission. It's located at 3821 North Brown Avenue, Scottsdale. It was built in 1932 to 1933, the original church of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. It was the re religious center of Scottsdale's Mexican community, serving the spiritual needs of imported laborers and their families. Its modern namesake, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, is located a few blocks east of here. The transformational effect of constructing the mission involved the women of the local Mexican community. Spearheaded by Doña Dolores Rivera de Ochoa, a woman with pioneering spirit organized the women. The women were responsible for advertising, coordinating of fundraising events, and providing the on-site workers with food, water, and encouragement. Jesus Corral, a construction laborer and avocational artist, became a master at personal networking, a go-to guy for pulling people together. Through Jesse Benton Evans, a close friend and artistic mentor, Corral drew together Robert T. Evans, Jesse's son and designer of the Jakaki Inn, as well as Father James Davis. Father Davis was the pastor of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in Tempe and was responsible for Scottsdale's remote Roman Catholic population. Evans generously designed and donated the architectural plans for the mission and provided the construction equipment and supplies. Father Davis secured a $1,000 grant for the construction of the roof and was the person who provided the pieces of stained glass discarded from the renovation of a Tucson cathedral. This glass became the working material for Burnaby Herrera's 15 stained glass windows. This mission was built with 50 pound adobe bricks like this. They're made of mud and miscellaneous material. They were all, there's approximately 14,000 adobes in this mission. They're all handmade, hand carried, and hand laid by the local people here in the valley in this mission. Uh, most of the work was done by the local Mexican people. After they put in a hard day at, on the job, they would come over here, volunteer their extra hours to build this church, and because it was more than just a church. It was the beginning of a community. The brick lane, roof raising, and other construction work was performed in the sometimes unforgiving Arizona heat by Mexican men who would work a full day in the local cotton fields or at local ranches and construction sites, then assemble in the mission to donate additional physical labor. Barnaby Herrera designed and built these old windows. I found them on the floor in this old mission in various states of disrepair and destruction. My job was to restore them. I either got that job or I charged for the 23 years I had them in, in possession. So as a rental charge, they are all original, original glass and uh, are done in the original designs. The glass is cathedral glass so-called cathedral because it was made for domestic use. It's also antique glass, which is mouth-blown glass. So it is not antique in the sense of style of glass, but in years. 
The church was built in 1933. The windows were built sometime after and framed individually. The job I had was to bring them back to life. And that life is now represented here in the sanctuary. And it came to pass that with the efforts of Jesus Corral and his brothers, Bernabe Herrera and others in the community, this building came to pass. With the support of the Evans family and Father Davis, the mission, Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church, was completed in October 1933. It served as a mission church and later as a parish church until 1956 when a larger church was built. It was placed on Scottsdale Registry of Historic Buildings in 2001. Physical restoration began in 2002 and remains a continuous process. This testament to Scottsdale's Mexican soul remains open to the general public. It's available from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily from November through May. When you're in downtown Scottsdale, take a break from your shopping and dining and drop by the old Adobe Mission and enjoy some quiet and reflective time with Scottsdale's Mexican soul. The Prada del Sol Parade is a tradition that dates back to the 1950s in Scottsdale. It is also known as the world's largest horse-drawn parade. Len is there to tell us more. Len? Welcome to Scottsdale, Arizona in February. While the rest of the United States is getting around by dog sled, here in Scottsdale, folks are celebrating warm weather and sunshine with the world's largest equestrian parade. Over 150 entrants that are pushed, pulled, carried, or escorted by horses. The tradition of a Western-themed, horse-oriented winter celebration began in 1951 when the Scottsdale Chamber of Commerce held its first Sunshine Festival Parade. The Sunshine Festival Parade complemented Scottsdale's marketing brand as the West's most Western town. The Sunshine Festival Parade was a rousing success, and in 1953, the event was renamed the Parada del Sol, and its management was assumed by the Scottsdale JCs. The Parada was complemented in 1955 by the development of the Arabian Horse Show. As the 1950s unfolded, the Parada blossomed. It added parade queens, the Howdy Dudettes, local high school girls who greeted visiting dignitaries and tourists, and also had a printed program that in 1959 featured this quintessential cowgirl on the cover. The Parada has drawn celebrities over the years, such as Amanda Blake, Miss Kitty from the 1960s Gunsmoke series, shown here escorted by the Howdy Dudettes in 1957, and country singer Buck Owens, who participated in the Parada, in 1987. The noble centerpiece of the Parada has been the horse, of course. On the other hand, the Parada has over the years accommodated a variety of our domesticated friends. Dogs, geese and ducks, cattle, and the occasional buffalo. Perhaps the wildest of Scottsdale's animals, the Scottsdale Librarian Book Cart Precision Drill Team. The Parada del Sol has become a bridge event during the winter between celebrations of horsepower and horse flesh. So if you're visiting Scottsdale during the winter and planning to attend the Barrett Jackson, Russo Steel, or other automobile shows, or if you're here for the Arabian Horse Show, book a few extra days and take in the Parada del Sol. You'll be glad you did. However, once the parade is over and you step off the curb to cross Scottsdale Road, be sure that you've got a good pair of boots and a keen eye because you want to step carefully. You do not want to step into the path of a library cart. Len is back as he guides us on a tour of one of Scottsdale's oldest buildings, the Little Red Schoolhouse. 
A hundred years ago in territorial Arizona, an emerging settlement was considered civilized if it had two things, a schoolhouse and a post office. Early schoolhouses in developing settlements were the equivalent of the Greek agora or the Roman forum, a gathering place for education, government, and citizen interaction. Early schoolhouses served many functions. This schoolhouse, the Little Red Schoolhouse in Scottsdale, Arizona, might give a cat some competition. It's had at least nine lives. Built in 1909 at a cost of $5,000 to replace a 16 by 18 foot wooden structure that originally served 14 pupils, the Little Red Schoolhouse has served as school, church, police station and jail, town hall, city library, chamber of commerce office, Red Cross bandage rolling center, polling place, and is currently in its ninth life as the home of the Scottsdale Historical Society. Let's take a tour of this building with the museum's director, Joanne Handley. This is Joanne Handley, the manager of the Scottsdale Historical Society's museum, which is housed here in the Little Red Schoolhouse. Joanne, uh, this building's just a little over a hundred years old. It was dedicated, I think, in 1910. Can you tell us a little bit about who was here and what the dedication was like? Yes, it would, uh, Winfield Scott felt that because we had this beautiful brick building after this little wooden one-room school house that we really needed to have a, a dedication. And they pick, tried to pick several days and things did not work out and somebody finally suggested that it would be held February 26, 1910. That was Winfield Scott's 73rd birthday. Several people came to the, to the uh, dedication from the community and did the uh, Richard Sloan, who was governor of Arizona, Thomas R. Marshall, who at the time was governor of Indiana, and William Arthur, professor, who was the director of the Arizona uh, Normal School in Tempe. Those were the people that came to this as well as the community. And Winfield Scott was delighted and gave a very uh, great speech about how proud he was that this community had come together and had this building built and he thought it would be uh, forever and we're still in the little red schoolhouse. Why would the governor of Indiana show up for a dedication here in Scottsdale? He had a, uh, a winter home. Uh, Marshall Way is named for him. The home was on Indian School just east of Marshall Way and that was where his uh, house was and uh, he and his wife would spend the winters out here uh, not very often in the summer, but more often they spent the winters here. What we have here in the Historical Museum for the out-of-town people that come to visit Scottsdale, uh, most of them are very interested in the history of Scottsdale. So they will come to see what we have here in the museum. We have uh, displays on the Little Red Schoolhouse. Uh, we have a, the Country Kitchen, which uh, could also have been a, a tent house. They're fascinated with those kinds of things. Uh, and then our uh, this small display on Winfield Scott. And they are interested in Winfield Scott because they have heard of Winfield Scott. But what they have heard was the general, not the chaplain. So we have to uh, educate the people as to which Winfield Scott. But when people come from all over the world, and literally we've had them here, from China, South America, from Asia, uh, many from Europe, <clears throat> Canada, Mexico, they come and visit Scottsdale and will visit this little museum because they want to see, the, learn about the history of Scottsdale.
Thank you for joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed this brief visit to the Little Red Schoolhouse in Scottsdale, Arizona, a building with nine lives. It's at 1733 East Scottsdale Mall. Come out and visit it and see Scottsdale's yesterdays still being used today. Up next, we're uncovering the mystery behind a special car that aided one president in laying secret plans for World War II. Len takes us to McCormick Stillman Railroad Park to learn about the Pullman car. On August 3rd, 1941, three avid fishermen and poker playing pals boarded this railroad car in Washington, D.C., looking forward to a 10-day fishing excursion off the coast of New England. They were joined by the fourth member of their party, a wealthy and well-known executive with a certain amount of celebrity who was followed by a cadre of reporters. The four fishing buddies boarded this car, headed for New London, Connecticut, with the reporters in tow. At New London, the four pals boarded the wealthy executive's yacht for a relaxing day of ocean fishing off Martha's Vineyard. Once out of sight of the reporters, the yacht was met by the U.S. Navy heavy cruiser Augusta. The wealthy executive was taken aboard and transported to a remote location off the coast of Newfoundland where, on August 9th, he was transferred to the British battleship Prince of Wales for a secret meeting with the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. By now, you've probably deduced that the wealthy executive was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And now you know that this railroad car, located at the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park in Scottsdale, was the initial vehicle in a plot to mislead the American press and facilitate a top secret mission prior to America's entry into World War II. The meeting between FDR and Winston Churchill resulted in the Atlantic Charter, a joint U.S. and British declaration of democratic principles in opposition to Nazi Germany. By the way, once the fishing trip was concluded, the four buddies rode this railroad car back from New London, Connecticut to Washington, D.C., probably playing a few hands of poker along the way. Four months after the Atlantic Charter was declared, four months after the secret meeting, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States found itself fully engaged in World War II. In order to protect the president and ensure additional secrecy with regard to his movements, this car was housed in a special underground facility beneath the Bureau of Engraving Building. This allowed the president to board unobserved for secret trips to U.S. military installations during the war. If you're a Canadian visitor or seasonal resident in Scottsdale, you're probably familiar with NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, a joint Canada-U.S. air defense agreement. The initial agreement was reached between Canadian Prime Minister William Lloyd Mackenzie King and Franklin Delano Roosevelt in August of 1940 at Ogdensburg, New York, and signed in this railroad car. During their discussions, both Prime Minister King and President Roosevelt slept over in this car at a secluded railroad siding surrounded by Secret Service agents and soldiers with fixed bayonets. The initial agreement, called the Ogdensburg Declaration, was critically important to Canada's security as several regiments of the Canadian Army and most of its Air Force were deployed in Britain during the war. This car actually has a name. It's the Rolled Amundsen car. Let's take a look inside. Hi, Bob. Hi. How are you? Okay, how are you? Fine. This is Bob Adler. Bob is a docent here at the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park, and nobody knows more about the Amundsen car than Bob. He's going to take us for a walkthrough. Let's go. As we enter the, the Rolled Amundsen, 
The first area that we come to is the area that was occupied by the cook and the porter. They were the servants in the car or the crew. And the first door is the kitchen where they cooked for the President of the United States. Uh, in there you can see the stove, that, the coal stove that they cooked on. And in the mirror you can see the refrigerator freezer units that are over on the left side. The second door is called the pantry. Uh, also part of the work area for the cook and the porter and where they kept their pots and pans. Uh, it has a pass-through where the cook could pass the food through to the porter and he could take it out to the dining area and serve the president. The third room is where the cook and the porter lived while they were working on the train. Uh, it has a bed that pulls down from the ceiling and the two chairs that you see down below uh, come together and make another bed. The little table that's there drops down and makes room for the chairs to come together and make the bed. This is the dining area where the president ate his meals and perhaps uh, spent time uh, meeting with people. Uh, the picture on the wall there is Mamie Eisenhower in the polka dot skirt. Uh, that was taken on Eisenhower's campaign trip in this car in 1952. At that time, the car was owned by the New York Central Railroad and they loaned it to Eisenhower for his campaign trip. He traveled around the country for two months living in this car and campaigning, but that's the only time they used it. And the picture is taken right there where it's hanging. The table that you see in the corner of the picture is the same table that's still here. All the china is the original Pullman china and silverware. The third door is where the president would have slept. That's the best room in the house, actually, and could actually be uh, called the presidential suite. Uh, it also has a pull-down bed, which probably hardly ever got used when the presidents were traveling in this car. Uh, and his bed runs in the other direction, so it's six inches longer than the other beds. It's six and a half feet long. And his room is a foot wider than the other rooms. And his is the only room that doesn't have a sink and toilet right in his room. Uh, go ahead. And the reason he doesn't have a sink and toilet in his room is because he has his own bathroom uh, with a shower. And of course the sink and toilet as well. Okay. The third adjoining room that could be considered part of the presidential suite uh, could have been a sitting room for the president, but it also has a pull-down bed and its own sink and toilet, so if the president had someone else traveling with them that needed their own room to sleep in, they could have slept in there. And this final room in the Royal Amundsen is called the Observation Room, and President Roosevelt spent a lot of his traveling time in this very room. In many cases, he played solitaire, sitting right where I am now, and there are three pictures up on the wall here uh, that show President Roosevelt sitting in the chair right where I am now. Wow, what a great place from which to give a speech. In fact, this car was used by Presidents Hoover and Eisenhower during their respective presidential campaigns of 1932 and 1952. Ike and his wife Mamie traveled the United States in this car for two months during the 1952 campaign. Earl Eisenhower Jr., a Scottsdale resident and historic preservation commissioner, shares with us some of the memories of his Uncle Dwight's campaign. Well, as I said a little bit earlier, two things. One was the old whistle stop train was a time-honored political uh, fact of, of life in those days. I mean. It, if you could get hold of a train, that, that was great. And another thing was that Aunt Mamie had um, an inner ear problem most all of her life. So she couldn't, she only flew under duress. And in fact, the only time I remember her doing it was coming back from Paris. She was very sick. She had pneumonia, double, triple. But she had to fly back uh, from Paris. And that, she didn't like it, but she had to. So that was one of the reasons that Dwight decided to do this train trip. It was time that he could spend with her, you know, in, in this car, he could, if he wanted to, seal himself off from uh, the rest of the entourage. Would, you can imagine a presidential campaign, there's some more hangers on than you need to have. And he decided that was one way he and Mamie could spend a little time without 
disrupting the whole political uh, process that he was going through at the time. So he, uh, I think that was one of the, two of the big reasons, uh, you know, just the historical reason of doing it plus the Aunt Mamie's condition. And I think that's when he went out on the end of the car and talked to the people. I think he enjoyed it because he was communicating with actual people. He wasn't doing it through television or radio or something like that. He was actually seeing faces in front of him. And I think he liked that part of it. And he, um, he to that extent, he enjoyed the, the political side of it because it was, you say he had a couple months on this card, they'd make these whistle stops, as they called them in those days, and it was, I was um, a little bit different attitude for him, but he mastered it very well because he had this initial attitude of people are basically good, and he went from that, that premise on. We hope you've enjoyed this brief visit to a railroad car with secrets, the Amundsen car at the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park in Scottsdale. Finally, under the still glassy water of El Dorado Lake lurked an enigma that had even the mayor calling for action. Len lands the story of Scottsdale's own Loch Ness Monster. Welcome to the lake at El Dorado Park in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona. Look at that calm, refreshing water in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. So peaceful, so refreshing. But what lies beneath the surface? What long lost mystery lurks beneath the waves? Is there more than meets the eye to this particular pond? In 1970, Scottsdale's political and administrative leaders decided to develop a water feature here as part of a plan to create the nation's first urban campground facility, a place where city dwellers could camp out and enjoy the desert as well as a well-stocked fishing and swimming lake. Any survivor of an Arizona summer can appreciate the value of such an amenity. And so, a large depression was excavated in the spring of 1970. In a stroke of good luck, the creation of the lake began ahead of schedule when excess irrigation canal water was supplied by the Salt River Project. Local children, no respecters of public works departments or their dedication schedules, began to wade and swim in the lake as soon as the water began to flow, despite warnings from city officials that the water was unsafe and unsanitary. On April 16th of 1970, the unsettling truth about the unsafe nature of the lake emerged. Scottsdale residents were shocked to learn that Mayor Bud Timms was considering the exercise of his emergency powers under the city charter to bar public access to the lake because of reports regarding a 20-inch, quote, denizen of the deep, said to be terrorizing small ducks. As cited in the newspaper article, strange occurrences were happening in this lake. Mayor Bud Timms was so concerned for the safety of the citizens, and especially the children in this community, that he took action. The city council in support of the mayor expressed concern that the creature might become a real menace. Said the vice mayor, I would hate for Scottsdale to have a reputation of being a city that allows children to be gobbled up by a fish in one of the lakes in a city park. Two days later, April 18th, local insurance executives from Kaywood and Sutterquist Insurance indicated their intention to contact Lloyds of London in order to arrange for a $1 million insurance policy against what was now reported to be the, quote, 22-inch battle-scarred bass inhabiting the lake. Notwithstanding the growing concern within the community, 
Scottsdale civic and political leadership bravely proceeded with a formal dedication of the lake on April 23rd. Four days later, a, quote, terrified Scottsdale youth reported that a 30-inch bull bass had attacked his dog, attempting unsuccessfully to pull the unfortunate canine into the depths of El Dorado Lake. Later that same day, Scottsdale officials received advice from Scottish officials based on their experience with the Loch Ness Monster. The advice? Keep youngsters under six years of age from the water's edge, particularly during fog and heavy rain. On April 30th, the mayor ordered the lake closed after it was reported that a youngster hooked the beast and was subsequently dragged partly into the water, saved only when his fishing rod broke under the weight of the now 23-inch monster fish. Apparently the creature, having been denied human fodder, had begun to shrink. Later that same day, a $1 donation campaign was begun to stop the fish, whose monstrous existence was theorized to be the possible result of Russian or communist experimentation with hormone warfare. On May 1st, a breakthrough occurred. The first photo of the monster appeared courtesy of Scottsdale resident Enoch Walking Stick, who claimed that he saw the huge fish enjoying a cigar after devouring a hapless swimming duck. A police volunteer diver donned scuba equipment, entered the lake, but beat a prompt retreat when confronted by the 24-inch creature. Concerned with the report that the beast was again growing, the mayor ordered that every effort be made to, quote, catch the monster. Sometime between May 1st and May 3rd, the city administration and local Kiwanians, desperate to stem a growing threat to local tourism, turned to their last line of defense, sponsoring a fishing derby for local children to capture the rampaging beast, now reported by the mayor to be 33 inches long. Clearly, the Russian hormone plot was succeeding. On May 3rd, noted Loch Ness Monster Authority Sir Angus McFergus arrived in Scottsdale. He suggested providing the now 35-inch monster with a cow to eat, acknowledging that throwing a black Angus in the lake was not a good idea in the West's most western town, Sir Angus retreated from his advice and suggested perhaps a dog or a cat might make a suitable lake warming gift. Later the same day, local resident Julie Tinker reported that her little sister had been pulled into the lake by the now 40-inch monster. The younger Tinker avoided a horrible end when she stubbornly held on to a stump on the lake shore. And so, on Saturday, May 4th, the confrontation of man and beast, well, kid and beast, took place. 150 youngsters armed with rods, reels, worms, minnows, spinners, cheese, salmon eggs, and the eternally optimistic courage of callow youth came to hunt the stogie chomping subsurface menace. Bluegills, bass, and frogs were taken that day, but the largest trophy appears to have been a six inch bass. Doubtless, larger fish had become victims of the monster. Perhaps the fishing derby was an effective countermeasure. The monster has not been seen since. Some believe that it entered the irrigation laterals in Scottsdale and made its way to Buckeye. Others believe that it burrowed into the mud of this lake and has estivated for decades, awaiting the proper time to reappear. Perhaps Bill Murphy, can provide some insights into this unsolved mystery. The fact of the matter was, this was a fish story. It was created by the mayor's office and members of the Parks and Recreation Department, as well as the Scottsdale Progress. It was to help promote the Scottsdale's Derby, fishing derby, which would be held here at El Dorado Park. There really never was a killer fish that we know of. Scottsdale residents with information regarding the beast should contact the Channel 11 staff at this number. No one seems to want to discuss this mysterious and unresolved case, which remains lurking, ever lurking, darkly in the depths of El Dorado.
Well, that's it for this special edition of Scottsdale Roundup. Didn't get enough? You can find more at the city's website, scottsdaleaz.gov. Look for quick links and click on Watch City Cable Channel 11. You can also watch us on our YouTube channel, Scottsdale AZ Gov. We'll see you next time.